Welcome to the Independent Advisors Podcast, where we dive into the world of stocks, tradable markets, and financial planning with Jessup Wealth Management's Chief Investment Officer, Mark McEvely, and CEO, Matt Jessup. You'll hear tips, tricks, and strategies to address your financial well-being, and most importantly, conveyed in a way that everyone can understand. Here are your hosts, Mark and Matt. Hey everyone, welcome to episode number 141 of the Independent Advisors Podcast, where Matt Jessup and I, Mark McEvely, bring you everything you need to know from the past week in the world of financial markets and financial planning. So good morning, Matt. Good morning, Mark. How are you doing? Good. Good. Again, looking forward to the warm weather the next couple of days here and hopefully this weekend. It's officially no sock weather. I here, like that. So not wearing any fancy socks today. Well, I got my colorful socks on. Nice. And it's March Madness time. It is. At least something to distract us from this challenging market. Right, right. But it is a little disappointing that our UD Flyers were the first team out of the tournament. I so know, so that's close. Very disappointing. So close. So it's always next year, right? That's right. <laughs> They're young. Yep. Uh, before we begin, as always, want to take the first couple of minutes to recap the performance for the month and the year of the major indexes that we track. And these numbers are as of the market close on March 14th, and this data is from Coifin. S&P 500 index down 4.6% for the month and down 12.45% for the year. The Dow down point, or excuse me, 2.8% for the month and 9.3% for the year. The NASDAQ composite index down 5.1% for the month and down 17.9% for the, for the year. IWM ETF that tracks the Russell 2000 index down 5.2% for the month and down 13.3% for the year. The Vanguard International ETF X United States down 6.4% for the month and down 11.6% for the year. So earlier in the year, International was outperforming, but it seems like that's, that trade is starting to unravel a little bit relative to U.S. markets. Yeah. Um, Three-month T-bill currently yielding 0.45%. The two-year Treasury yield currently sitting at 1.85%. And the 10-year Treasury yield at 2.12%. And I like to go through these uh, every week, Matt, because especially with yields on government bonds, you start to notice a change from week to week when these numbers move. So Correct. You know, the big thing from me is obviously, you know, rates are rising. Um, but the thing that that is a little concerning to me is the the two year treasury yield and the 10 year treasury yield are uh, converging, meaning that spread is getting smaller and smaller. And what does that mean? And, you know, for you know long time listeners, I don't want to beat a dead horse because you heard us say this before, but. You know, when you buy a 10 year treasury yield, you're expecting to get a higher interest rate because you're taking more risk by locking up your money theoretically for 10 years, right? And relative to when you buy a two year treasury bond, hypothetically speaking, there shouldn't be as much risk. Hence, the two year treasury bond should be uh, yielding less than the 10 year. So, when the two-year uh, starts to get close to yielding the same as the 10-year, that's concerning to me because that's one of the only indicators that has been uh, very, very accurate over time at predicting recessions. So meaning when the two-year treasury yield is higher than the 10-year treasury yield, at some point within the next several months, a recession has occurred. Correct. Now, I'm not saying that's imminent. Sometimes it takes a couple of months for the recession uh, onset, and sometimes it takes more than a year for that, right? So we saw this uh, happen in August of 2019, which was uh, a little more than six months before the COVID crash in 2020. So that's just something that stood out to me this morning as I was getting these numbers ready. Um, Again, not trying to scare people out there, but it is something that we're watching and that could be concerning if that two year does start to yield more than the 10 year. Yeah. And the term that the listeners might might hear in the news is an inverted yield curve. Right. Is the technical term that you might hear in the news. Definitely something we want to watch. I mean, you know, I think that there is a lot of what I would say cross currents in the bond market with. Do you work for the Fed? (laughs) It might start to sound like Jay Powell. 
I think he's used cross currents a couple of times. Oh my gosh. I'm turning into a Fed official. What is wrong with me? No, it's just my, my opinion is there's a lot of cross currents. I think that with the Fed <clears throat> getting rid of their money printing program, the fact that the market's anticipating higher rates this year, um, you know, we'll get into, you know, I think our thoughts on that in a little bit, but I just think there's a lot going on uh, right now um, in, in the bond market. It's not as simple as it used to be. Right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And that's the other thing too, is we're in an environment <laughs> where, you know, correlations between, you know, stocks and bonds are on their way to one. Right. Yeah. So, you know, just because stocks are going down, a lot of the bond proxies and indices are down as well. Maybe everything, not down it, as much, but yeah, everything gets really correlated in these crisis times. And people will sit there and say, well, I own bonds because they tend to do good when stocks aren't. And everything's been working in lockstep lately. Right, right. Um, so moving on to uh, big news and headlines, current events from the week. Uh, obviously, the markets have continued their volatile ride over the past week. But I think the major headline or takeaway coming out of this week is that the Fed uh, finishes up its two-day meeting today uh, when they're discussing interest rate hikes. And that announcement should be around 2 o'clock Eastern time today. So what are you expecting from them? I'm personally expecting a quarter of a point raise with some sort of burbage that isn't as aggressive or isn't as hawkish as it was in the past couple of meetings. You know, I still think that there's a lot of people on the street expecting upwards of eight quarter of a point interest rate hikes this year, though anything's possible. I'm not in the high end of the camp. Yeah, I don't see that either. I think, you know. I think it would have been a different discussion if the Fed decided to raise rates at some point last year. Um, but again, this is just my opinion. I think inflation peaks at some point this year, probably over the summer. Um, and then you have, uh, you know, decelerating inflation, rising interest rates um, and possibly hurting consumer demand. I mean, it's anyone's best guess as to how that's going to play out. But and again, I, I think the the Fed is always in a tough spot, right? They're damned if they do, damned if they don't with this type of stuff. Oh, yeah. So um, like you said, there is a lot of stuff going on that goes into these decisions. And obviously the um, Russia-Ukraine uh, conflict is not helping anything. Um, let but me, Let me tell you why I think it's going to be less than eight. I think it's going to be less than eight because ultimately they don't want to have to backtrack. They don't mm -hmm. want to overdo it, then have to lower rates and be herky jerky about it. Right. So that's why I, I also think that they're going to be slower in these rate rises and they have the cover of what's going on internationally now to even do that further. Right. My two cents. Yeah, I agree. Um, <clears throat> moving on to tweets, articles and research from the week. Um, had a lot of stuff from Michael Batnick. He's putting out a lot of he actually puts out a lot of good stuff during times of uh quote unquote crises mm -hmm. um, with volatility in the market. So this one was from March 8th titled There's Blood in the Street. So I just wanted to read it just a little snippet from this uh, blog post. He said the Nasdaq 100 is currently in the third bear market of the last five years. Tech stocks are getting vaporized. Netflix and Facebook are trading at the same level they were at 2018. The three strongest names in the group, Apple, Google and Microsoft, are all in correction territory. Fun fact, PayPal is the 20th biggest company in the S&P 500 and has had the honor of losing more market cap than all but seven companies. A 70% decline in seven months for a mega cap company is really something else. That's carnage. That's carnage. It's hard to find a lot of positives to say about the current market environment, but I'll try anyway. These businesses are cheaper today than they were a year ago. So again, if you're a optimist and believe in the strong future of the U.S. economy and the, really the world economy, you know, this could be the fat pitch that a lot of people have been waiting for over the past couple of years. Oh, yeah, man. I've got to be careful with this one with me. I'm going to get you on my soapbox. <laughs> yeah, well, um, tweet we'll just move research number one. right along here. <laughs> uh, the next thing I had was a blog post by Jeff Hirsch on March 2nd titled uh, Contrary Bearish Sentiment Near Bottoming Levels. And I'll have Jenna throw this up on the YouTube video uh, for those watching here. You can check it out at our show notes. Um, at Jessup Wealth on Twitter or Jessup Wealth Management on Facebook and LinkedIn. Um, so he shows a chart of the S&P 500 index 
uh, and the difference between uh, bulls and bears. Uh, so Jeff says, uh, yesterday's invested investors intelligence advisor sentiment report showed more bears than bulls for the first time since March and April of 2020 pandemic lows. This level of pessimism has historically occurred near market bottoms. Negative sentiment tend, tends to worsen before it and the market turns. It's not perfect and can go much lower uh, over an extended period of time like it did in 08 and 09. The current market climate does not seem to be akin to the financial crisis with the economy humming along. Subsequent market and sentiment lows seem more comparable to the present with inflation concerns, a pending rate tightening period, geopolitical anxieties, and rising energy prices. So, um, obviously, this doesn't mean that the market's ready to start going back up again, but just historically over the past decade, we're at levels where you know people are pretty bearish out there and it's hard to find anyone that's optimistic going forward. Um, that great be, contrarian indicator. Yeah, yeah, it is a great contrarian great indicator. Great contrarian indicator. But the important thing to know is it, you know, it could always get worse. <laughs> it could always get worse. Absolutely. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Um, so just thought it was it was interesting because there are not a lot of bulls out there right now. Yeah. And so when I see stuff like this to kind of translate it to our viewers and listeners, people who were concerned about the market are either hedged or they've lowered their risk exposure, cash on the sidelines. And it's like everyone in the room is looking for, okay, when are people going to start buying? And you have that flood of money come in. So, you know, with that being said, you know, it feels like we're in the vicinity. Yeah. Yeah, I would say so. Um, lastly, this was a blog post from Cullen Roche titled, Bitcoin is a terrible form of money, but a very good store of value. So uh, I want to preface this with... Um, this isn't a recommendation for or against cryptocurrencies or Bitcoin in general, but just thought it was a, a good piece that I tend to agree with here. Okay. Um, so Colin starts off and he says, <laughs> this is kind of funny. He says, I have to put on my flame retardant suit for this one because the Bitcoin community is not going to like this. Here goes nothing. Oh, here we go. <laughs> Money has always, uh, or excuse me, money always has to be defined in a unit of account. That could be Bitcoin, US dollar, whatever. Money cannot be a perfect medium of exchange and store of value at the same time. No asset in human history has ever served as a perfect store of value and perfect medium of exchange over long periods of time because there are necessary trade offs in the structure of these items that give them different benefits. I've argued that the defining feature of money is that you should be able to pay for things with it. If you can't walk into Walmart and use it to buy stuff, then it's not money. Medium of exchange is the key feature of what gives something moneyness. If you can't buy stuff with it or it isn't widely accepted, then it doesn't have a high degree of moneyness. The property that makes something a very good medium of exchange is its short-term nominal stability because this gives its users short-term predictability. Very key term. Yes. Stability. Stability. A dollar today is a dollar next month. So if I have a $1,000 credit card payment due in 30 days, I know with absolute certainty that my $1,000 will be there if I hold $1,000 of bank deposits or cash. On the other hand, if I decided to hold this $1,000 in Apple stock, I would expose myself to the risk that Apple stock can decline in value and I won't be able to meet my $1,000 liability in 30 days. This is why Apple stock is a poor medium of exchange. There are no free lunches here. When you get into short-term nominal stability, you give up in long-term. What you get in short-term nominal stability, you give up in long-term purchasing power. In other words, while a U.S. dollar is a great medium of exchange, it's a horrible store of value because inflation erodes its purchasing power over time. Apple stock, on the other hand, is best thought of as a long-duration instrument that can be a very good store of value over long periods of time. But that trade-off for this long-term store of value is that it's a poor short-term medium of exchange. And he has this uh, scale of moneyness that he uh, puts in this article. So assets that are low level of moneyness or poor medium of exchanges, commodities and other goods, securities and various claims on money, foreign currencies, gold and Bitcoin, high levels of moneyness are government money or outside money, bank deposits or inside money. 
Uh, wrapping up, he says, Bitcoin is a lot like Apple stock and that it has been a wonderful store of value, but also a terrible medium of exchange. The reason is it's a bad form of money because it's impossible to plan around. Financial Planning 101 will teach us that we need to manage our liabilities across time. This is the key feature of any good financial plan. Bitcoin does not fix this. In fact, its volatility makes short-term planning nearly impossible. <laughs> you cannot reliably plan for that $1,000 credit card payment due in 30 days if you hold Bitcoin. But again, there are no free lunches. While Bitcoin is a terrible medium of exchange, it has been an incredible store of value. This is a feature of Bitcoin, not a bug. And Bitcoin does not have to try to solve both the medium of exchange and store of value problem. He says, P.S. Hey, Bitcoin maxis, try not to get emotional damage from this post. There are a lot of great things about Bitcoin. The fact that it isn't a very good form of money doesn't detract from those things. I don't disagree with anything you said. So I think it's... I, it, I mean, it's as black and white as you can make it, I think. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, because remember, it is, I think, what a very pro crypto person would say is that as it, let's assume it becomes more and more widely accepted, then it be, the, their, their feeling is it would become more and more stable. It mm -hmm. would be less volatile. And kind of like uh, the people thinking that we're going to have self-driving cars in two years, just pick me up and take me somewhere. And I'm never going to have to touch a steering wheel. That's a pipe dream. Mm -hmm. Okay. The next couple of years. Yeah. So it's going to take a long time to get there if it does. And that's the best way I can say it with a disclaimer. Yeah. And, it, and you can think of it too, you know, when we're talking to clients about, you know, I'm getting ready to to look for a house in the next year. But we put my money the, in Bitcoin to wait. Right. It's the same thing or stocks for that matter. Sure. Right. It's like, you don't know if you're going to have that money by the time you make an offer on a house. So you want to have that cash for the down payment in cash because that cash will be cash two, three, four months down the road. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, what do you got this week? All right. I'm starting, I'm starting hard right out of the gates. <laughs> You expect anything less from me? No. Okay, here we go. Oil spikes and economic outcomes. It's a post from Zero Hedge. Uh, the blog post they had on March 11th. There'll be some corresponding charts that Jenna's going to put up on the screen for our YouTube uh, viewers and then for our listeners. Uh, Mark, you want to remind them how they can get this? Yeah, at Jessup Wealth on Twitter or Jessup Wealth Management on Facebook or LinkedIn. So the first chart they show is inflation adjusted oil prices with corresponding events. This chart begins as early as 1960. So again, the key word here is inflation adjusted oil prices. The first really surge you saw, and I used proper uses of the word surge, was back in 1980 for the Iranian hostage crisis. The inflation adjusted price of oil at that time peaked right around $140 in today's dollars, okay? And then leading up to the great financial crisis, you had oil peak at about $150 a barrel in today's dollars. Well, obviously this chart is showing a similar uh, path. Um, when this chart was published, oil was around 130, mm -hmm. okay? When it, when it, when it, when it peaked uh, just recently. And the next chart shows Surges in energy prices, suggesting high probability of a recession. And it, it really shows that when the, the price of oil tends to peak, and roughly, you know, if it gets above that $100 a barrel right now on Brent, it definitely increases the historical chances of a recession. So this is something why I want to bring it up is, this is why, in my opinion, the Chinese are not going to let sustained hundred dollar of oil stay in the market because the great the overall economy cannot afford that and they need to be do exports bad mm -hmm. okay so this chart backs up my thesis that that is actually 100 percent factual mm -hmm. okay so i'm going to read what they wrote and we'll then i'll get go to some feedback this is what the blog post said will oil prices cause a recession depends on the fed the risk of a recession is rising. The surge in artificial inflation from the flood of liquidity against a supply shortage, 
will eventually revert to a disinflationary trend. Debt and demographics will also continue to drive deflationary pressures leading to a reversal of the inflation trade. However, for now, as the fear of inflation rose, investors piled into the commodity trade. While commodity prices rose due to the supply shortage, the reversal of that liquidity in rebuilding of inventories will ultimately undermine those assets. Such with coinciding with a sharp decline in interest rates as deflation reemerges. Of course, slowing economic growth and deflationary pressures will contribute to the decline in oil prices. One of the things that could generate that environment sooner than later is the Federal Reserve's tightening monetary policy. Historically, when the Fed has hiked rates or tapered its balance sheet, oil prices fall due to slower economic growth. Such should not be surprising since oil prices are a function of supply and demand. So why do I bring this up? I think that right now you have oil internationally. The perception was that Russia can't sell its oil. False. They're going to sell it to other countries like India and China. They just won't buy it from other places. So I don't buy the whole long-term supply disruption camp. Secondly, I don't think the Chinese are going to allow $100 plus oil for an extended period of time. With all this being said, I'm not in the camp that oil is going to go to 200 And even if it spikes from here, I think it'll be short term. And I think this helps provide some cover for the Fed that if these prices come in, it helps the Fed not have to raise rates as quickly. Yeah, no, I agree. Um and it kind of looks like, I mean, just from us talking about the inversion of the yield curve earlier, it's almost shaping up to be a perfect storm for a rece- recessionary environment. It is, because if you look at this, if we have sustained oil above 100, you can see in this chart, and in, in, in listeners, I would recommend you pull it up. It's pretty accurate. Right. And um, yeah, so I think it's, I mean, I think a lot of people are expecting a recession and, and you know, I'm probably leaning towards that camp as well um you know but i I just want to throw it out there and i'm not trying to make things sound rosier than they are but not all recessions are equal right so we had a recession in 2020 that was a quick one right it wasn't as drawn out and painful compared to uh 2007 2008 where it was longer drawn out and markets got cut in half so just because we have an impeding recession on our hands doesn't tell you the the strength of the recession right that's or the duration of the recession. that's correct and i could even i can even argue that uh that could be priced in already right it could be right yeah all right so i got uh, two more things first uh is a global financial conditions okay another tweet by zero hedge on march 10th in the chart that they show was produced by goldman sachs Okay, the index that they're talking about, which is the Global Financial Conditions Index, is a proprietary weighted average of a large number of variables, over 100 mark, each expressed relative to their sample averages and scaled uh, by their standard deviations. It covers financial conditions of money markets, debts, equity markets, and the traditional and shadow banking systems. The chart goes back all the way to 2012, a decade, and it shows some of the tightest monetary conditions going back the last 10 years. Now, why is this important for our viewers and listeners? Conditions are the tightest they've been since 2015, 2016, when the market went through a rough patch. And I'm gonna paint the picture of what was going on there because we get out of these times and we tend for, to forget how bad that situation was. So I'm gonna paint it for you. During that time, the Chinese stock market was very poor. The SSE composite index fell 43% over two months in the summer of 2015 for the Chinese stock market. Investors started to sell stocks on a global basis on fears of a global economic slowdown that was appearing to begin in China. In addition, Greece defaulted on their debt in June of 2015. The market had a hangover from the end of QE, which happened in October of 2014, and then bond yields rose sharply in early 2016. What happened then in spring of 2016? Brexit was the it topic. A lot of uncertainty. 
And so why do I mention this? It is confirmation that things are tough for the whole monetary system, not just stocks, okay? This too shall pass. How long? That's anyone's guess. That is why I focus on individual companies whose earnings have not only held up in a lot of cases, Mark, but continue to rise over the last past several quarters. That is what matters, not these crazy predictions you hear every day. Mm -hmm. Your two cents. Yeah, I think it's, you know, it, like you said, I, you know, people have a short memory when it comes to markets and what was going on during different periods of time. But, you know, we've been through similar times like this before, but people just tend to forget. Yeah. I mean, if I sat there and said, hey, give me give me four good examples of a tough correction we went through in the past decade, I can probably tell you no one would have even talked about this. Right. Right. Exactly. Okay. Now, I'm going to put things into perspective because people see these numbers, but year to date, and people think the rest of the year, you know, I'm going to toss this year out. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there was a tweet by Charlie Bellillo on March 13th, and it says S&P 500 performance year to date. How does this compare to history? Okay. So uh, this chart will also be in our show notes, and Jenna will throw it up on the screen for our YouTube viewers. This chart will show the worst performance for the first 48 trading days going back to 1928. And do you want to guess where 2022 lands? Number four, the fourth worst start to a year. The only three years that beat this, 2009, 2020, and 1935, okay? When you look through this data set, it is absolutely amazing to see on average what the market has done. And only of the fifth, I'm sorry, of the 14 data sets, only two were negative. 01 down about 3% and 2008 down 32 in the great financial crisis. Why am I highlighting this? Statistically, looking back in the data sets with the poor start to the year doesn't necessarily mean the rest of the year is going to be poor as well. Yeah, exactly. And I think that that's something that we've talked about before but you know i think it's hard because people are are so anchored to like the calendar year in terms of in terms of performance correct where you know market cycles are not they perfect don't, like that for lack of a better term don't give a crap about your where we are year. in the calendar year that's right right yep um so it's almost not a a great metric to use to like just do it like on a year by year basis, especially, you know, times like these, because weakness can happen at any point during the year and strength can happen at any point during the year. Yeah. Look at the fourth quarter of 2018. Right. I mean, the market <laughs> right. was down 20%. Yeah. And, and, and perfectly in that quarter. Yeah. Perfectly. And, and from a seasonality standpoint, Q4 is a pretty good quarter. Yeah. Right. So, um, yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting, but yeah, I just agree. the fourth worst start. I thought it really, really interesting. Yeah. So and the numbers associated with those poor starts the rest of the year at the top were pretty good. Yeah. So it doesn't doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, people just throw in the towel and 2022 is completely shot, you yep. know, from a investment performance standpoint. Yep. So um, financial planning topic of the week comes from an article in the Wall Street Journal uh, It was written by uh, Glenn Ruffinich. I think I'm saying that name right, uh, on March 3rd of this year. And it was titled, Do Bucket Investment Strategies Make Sense in Retirement? So Glenn starts out by saying, using a bucket strategy, dividing your money into a handful of simple categories for an important goal is a fine way to manage and tap your nest egg later in life. This approach, though, likely does more for your mental health than it does for your portfolio. The mechanics are relatively simple. An investor sets up two or more buckets, each which hold specific kind of investments with different purposes and levels of risk. You can do this within a single retirement account and simply track on a spreadsheet, for instance, which investments are in which bucket. In a three-bucket model, the first bucket would hold cash. He says enough to cover about two to three years of living expenses. So I just want to pause there for a second, Matt. What are your thoughts here? Because I think if people can afford to do that, then it's great. But I have a feeling that most people 
in the U.S. at least, don't have the luxury of keeping that much cash since they still need their portfolios growing at a pretty good clip to get them the income they need in retirement. Yeah, I, I, I think that's that's definitely way too high, in my opinion, personally. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the only reason someone would really do that is if they were so skittish about the market that if it went down, someone's telling them, you have two years of reserves of income, let it It'll come back type Mm -hmm. of scenario. Right. So and he kind of gets into that a little bit. So the other buckets mostly would hold respectively bonds and stocks. A cash from bucket number one gets as cash from bucket number one gets spent. Buckets two and three are tapped to replenish. Note that how much stock is sold compared with the bonds depends on how each is performing. Some of the best research on how buckets perform comes from Joel Tomlin. Tomlinson, an actuary and financial planner who writes about retirement finances. In a study published in 2020, he looked at how various withdrawal strategies, including buckets, would fare over a 30-year retirement. In other words, would an investor end up depleting his or her savings? Mr. Tomlinson found that buckets, for the most part, did no better or worse than several other approaches. Using a collection of pails to manage your money isn't likely to give you fatter returns or help your nest egg last longer. Breaking your investments into buckets may help simplify your way of confronting market up and downs. Here are two scenarios. On a stock market dip, bond holdings may be shifted into stocks as stock prices fall. Monthly income comes from a combination of cash and bond holdings, which have held their value during the sell-off. On a stock market rebound, monthly income comes from selling stocks. Additional proceeds from cash or excuse me, from stock sales may move into bonds or cash. So why bother with buckets? Because they're designed to stop investors from making a fundamental error, selling stocks in down markets. Again, the sizable cash cushion in bucket number one means you don't have to worry about where your paychecks are coming from if the sky is falling. What's more, that knowledge, that confidence, if you will, makes it more likely that you'll stick with your investment strategy in the long run. Mm -hmm. So for the most part, you know, I think it's a good way for people that if they have, you know, that psychological, emotional battle going on with themselves, you know, to say, you know, what do I do during a time like this? I think it could help because you know what you're going to do in each market environment. Absolutely. I think it's no different. You know, you you heard us talk about the 60-40 portfolio, which is very popular for retirees, which is about 60% of the portfolio in stocks, 40% of the portfolio in bonds. Which is also off to one of its worst starts here to date. Exactly. And I think that historically, historically, that when stocks are weak, bonds tend to hold their own. And this is, again, very general general statement that, you know, when people need withdrawals, they would take it from the bond portion when stocks are weak and vice versa and then find their opportunities to rebalance. And I think it's no different. I just think that having the cash portion psychologically for those more concerned about market volatility, that's why you would do that. And my analogy is for someone who's budgeting doing the envelope strategy, which is my discretionary income, I take out for cash every month, I put in this envelope, this is what I get to spend guilt free, and it's not going to hurt my finances. Mm -hmm. It's all for the psychology aspect of it, right? Which I'm not against. Yeah, I just, we need to call it for what it is. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So could be beneficial to look into this for you if you feel like this would help. Um, But you know, there's multiple ways to, uh, to skin a cat, so to speak. Um, anything else you want to leave listeners with before we sign off for the week? So I have one comment from a listener. Listeners, gentleman's name is Barry. And Barry um, is saying more Taylor for financial planning topic of the week. Okay. I think she's a fan favorite. <laughs> uh, I've gotten messages a couple weeks before that uh, with some of the topics that she selected. Yeah. So uh, uh, n- no offense. No, you, I know. I, you, do, you do a I great love job. It. Yeah, less, do, less work for me. You do a great job. I think we need to. <laughs> Invite Taylor back for a people couple of want episodes. More, like people want, want more cowbell. They people want, more, want cowbell? more Taylor. One more Taylor. Yeah. Well, we'll slot Taylor in for the next couple of weeks for the financial planning topic of the week because that is her um, world of That's expertise. Her forte. So, um, yeah, we'll make sure to do that. Yeah. Okay. Well, everyone get your brackets done. Yeah, get your brackets done. Uh, March Madness. First four kicks off uh, t- today. Is it today mm. or tomorrow? I think it's Wednesday, Thursday. I could be wrong, though. Yeah, for at UD here. So yep. that would have been fun to watch Dayton play yeah. here. 
Wright State's playing at UDA. I know. I know. That's pretty cool. Yeah, very. All right, everybody. I uh, hope you enjoy the rest of your week and the warmer weather of head. And we will be back with you for episode number 142 next week. We'll see you then. Thank you for listening to the Independent Advisors podcast. If you're interested in hearing more, hit the subscribe button so you can be notified every time a new episode gets released. Feel free to share with friends, family, and follow us on Twitter at Jessup Wealth, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Mark and Matt will continue to share beneficial information on these social media sites. Also, check out the podcast tab on their website. That's www.jessupwealthmanagement.com. There you'll find links to every episode of the Independent Advisors. Have questions or topics you want to discuss on the show? Message us on Twitter, LinkedIn, or send an email with the words questions and topics in the subject line to inquiries at jessupwealthmanagement.com. We'll talk about it right here on the podcast. Certain sections of this commentary may contain forward-looking statements based on reasonable expectations, estimates, projections, and assumptions. Forward-looking statements are not guarantees of future performance and involve certain risks and uncertainties, which are difficult to predict. All indices are unmanaged and are not available for direct investment by the public. Past performance is not indicative of future results. This podcast is provided for general informational purposes only and does not constitute either tax, legal, or financial advice. Although we do go to great lengths to make sure our information is accurate and useful, we recommend you consult a tax preparer, professional tax advisor, financial advisor, or lawyer regarding your specific circumstances. Investing involves risk, including the loss of principal. No strategy can guarantee any objective or goal will be achieved. Advisory services offered through Commonwealth Financial Network, a registered investment advisor.